start by welcoming the audience to this third segment of our four-part program on digital activism and authoritarian adaptation in the Middle East. Thank you for joining us today. This series has been a great collaborative effort between three programs, the Arab Reform Program at Stanford University Center for Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law, the Program on Middle East Political Science, and the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford Cyber Policy Center. Last week, we held two panels in the series. The first focused on what digital activism looks like in the Middle East today. The second focused on authoritarian abuses of internet technologies for repression. repression. Today, we will focus on how governments are reshaping laws, norms, and practices to restrict online activity and constrain civil society more generally. And on Thursday this week, at the same time from 9 to 10.30 a.m. Pacific, the closing segment of the series will focus on cross-border information operations. Today we have an embarrassment of riches, five papers to discuss with six experts, each of whom will speak for about eight to 10 minutes. Let me briefly introduce the speakers to you. First off, Dr. Ahmed Shahid is an internationally recognized expert on foreign policy, international diplomacy, and human rights reform, especially in Muslim states. He has twice held the office of Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Republic of the Maldives. He currently serves as UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief and formerly served as UN Special Rapporteur on Iran, and we have been friends for years. Mona Elswa is a Doctor of Philosophy candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute. She studies digital repression, collective actions, and disinformation in the Arab world. And Masa Al-Mardani also is a Doctor of Philosophy candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute. Her research focuses on political communication and information controls in Iran, and they will jointly present a paper that they co-wrote. Mohammed Najam is the executive director of SMEX, a digital rights organization working to protect access to information, access to the internet and mobile services in the MENA region. James Shires is an assistant professor at the Institute for Security and Global Affairs at Leiden University, and an associate fellow with the Hague Program on Cyber Norms. And last but not least, Alexi Abrams is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Technology and Social Change Team at the Shorenstein Center at Harvard's Kennedy School. After we hear from the presenters, we'll have a conversation and we welcome questions from the audience. So please feel free to direct questions to particular speakers or to ask broad questions intended for the entire panel. You can use the Q&A feature rather than the chat feature and feel free to add questions as they occur to you while people are speaking. You don't need to wait till the end to the Q&A period. The arc of the program today will be as follows. We will start with Dr. Shahid, who will lead us in a discussion of new forms of legal repression in the cyber context. Masa and Mona together will present their work on the interplay between private sector content moderation policies and government pressure uh, to take down harmful content posted by activists, opposition figures, and dissidents. Mohammed will discuss the role of money and tech investment in building up ICT infrastructure for state surveillance and repression. James will then do a deeper dive on how authoritarian ICT infrastructure has advanced and actually functions. And Alexi will close with a discussion of the insecurity of web services used by civil society organizations in the region. With that, let's turn to Ahmed, Dr. Shahid. Thank you, Eileen. I should say Ambassador Naha and co-organizers for inviting me to this workshop. Really delighted to join an impressive panel of speakers this, this morning, this afternoon for me. Last week, we, hear, we heard about the cat and mouse game that speakers spoke about in terms of the tussle between authoritarianism and activism in, on, on online spaces. And this can be viewed as a contestation of norms. 
counterterrorism, public safety, public order, and public health are powerful norm blockers globally, while anti-blasphemy and morality laws find broad support in the MENA region. However, unless carefully tailored and applied, these norm blockers amount to serious violations of international human rights law. All MENA states, bar Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Oman, are party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which guarantees the right to privacy and other civic freedoms. These standards are additionally part of custom international law under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and are therefore binding on all states, regardless of their position with regard to the ICCPR. Nonetheless, the past decade has seen a proliferation of legislation across the region that restricts and even criminalizes legitimate exercise of these rights in digital spaces. So-called cyber crime laws drafted in the Gulf states and Egypt, Iran, and Jordan, for example, fall far short of international standards. Where a state wishes to impose a restriction on freedom of expression, it must inter alia draft a precise and unambiguous provision that is both necessary and proportionate. The provision must equally be lawful. They can never be used to muzzle advocacy of democratic tenets and human rights of, of people, for example. However, many cybercrime laws frame legitimate expression as potentially criminal activity. In the UAE, for example, decree number five of 2012 is used as a legal basis for the prosecution of individuals who, are, who use technology to criticize the government or organize unlicensed demonstrations. Jordan's cybercrime bill, for example, punishes digital libel and a vague conception of hate speech with up to three years in prison and additional punitive fines. Free expression also includes the right to impart and receive information of all kinds. However, censorship on the internet is fast becoming the norm rather than the exception in the Middle East and North, North Africa. The CPJ hit lists Saudi Arabia and Iran as two of the most censored states globally, blocking vast swathes of the internet deemed objectionable under their respective cybercrime legislation, especially regional human rights monitoring organizations that reflect on their practices. Likewise, Egyptian authorities have blocked access to over 500 websites, including news media, and again, prominent human rights organizations covered in the country's practice since under the 2018 cybercrime cyber crime laws in Egypt. At the behest of uh, Tunisia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Egypt, and Egypt, social media platforms have censored and disabled the accounts of activists, journalists, and citizens critical of their governments. Accusations of discriminatory censoring of, of Palestinians by Facebook are escalated uh, in particular in the recent, in, in last few weeks in the month of May. Lack of transparency in how takedown demands are enforced further obfuscates the impact on the rights of freedom of expression and on discrimination of affected communities by these uh, takedowns. Some MENA states use existing criminal laws to limit expression online, sometimes in combination with cybercrime laws. Prosecution under these laws often results in severe or increased penalties, incentivizing people to self-censor on specific topics. For example, Kuwait, Jordan, Egypt, Iran, and Saudi Arabia have all prosecuted human rights defenders for expression online under anti-blasphemy laws. These provisions carry can result in heavy prison sentences, and in Saudi Arabia and Iran, the death penalty as well. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, among others, also use overly broad defamation laws to prosecute individuals that criticize the government or spotlight corruption or malpractice in the government on online platforms. At the extreme, states are using military, anti-terrorism, and national security laws to undermine free expression association online. As with anti-blasphemy laws, even these laws often carry the most severe of penalties and are often used to target rights defenders by many states in the region. In many cases, the conviction is one of individual as a terrorist, may provide grounds for the prosecution of by associates of others or other persons in their on the, in the online network. So large amounts of people get immediately picked up by, conv by convicting one person. These new env regulatory environments also actively facilitate infringements on the right to privacy. The majority of countries in the region, including UAE, Egypt, Bahrain, Qatar, have some legal provisions for data protection that should further the enjoyment of the right to privacy. However, the vast majority of these laws provide insufficient protections against unauthorized processing of individuals' data and contain numerous and significant exemptions 
allowing the state security services to carry out invasive domestic surveillance. In, them, uh, in this problem, unlawful infringements of the right to freedom of uh, right, right to privacy also further suppress other rights. In some cases, beyond censorship, to, in, in, as we heard last week, can lead to targeted executions of those a, a, a state has a dislike to. The global COVID-19 pandemic has further worsened the adverse human rights impacts of, of law and policy affecting online spaces. And this international declared Bahrain and Kuwait's COVID tracking apps among the most dangerous in the entire world, categorizing them as highly invasive, surveillance tools, which go far beyond what is justified in efforts to tackle a public health emergency like, as such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Some maps such as Qatar's Etheras have been made mandatory for all residents and visitors that are required for entering many different spaces, shared spaces, including mosques, social venues, public transport, parks, schools, and childcare establishments. The app's security protocols and data retention policy have been a cause for concern both due to the possibility for hackers to access users' sensitive data and for government's ability to use the data for various purposes beyond prevent prevention of transmission of COVID. And like Qatar, most governments in the region have not developed COVID trans tracing apps with a clear and limited purpose with data protection by design and default. Where access to public spaces is predicted is, is dependent upon the user's consent to be monitored by such apps, Governments are forcing rights holders to choose between the right to privacy and a whole range of other rights, including freedom of movement, original belief, right to education, and the right to work. And where there are no such limitations, governments are still at best putting sensitive data of the citizens at risk, and at worst expanding surveillance state under the guise of medical imperative. The pandemic has further been used to justify restrictions on free speech under the guise of combating medical uh, misinformation or disinformation. In Algeria, for example, authorities have arrested journalists, bloggers, and others who contradict and, and criticize the government's handling of the COVID pandemic. Likewise, in Egypt, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, Bahrain, Iran, and Tunisia, and so on, have used the COVID-19 emergency measures or laws to arrest, detain, prosecute, or fine persons expressing opposition to the government's COVID response, or even criticizing the government on issues not linked to the COVID pandemic. Some Gulf states have exceptionally lifted restrictions on access to voice over IPs and encrypted chat apps during the pandemic. However, these gestures are insufficient as long as lawful access remains transient and popular apps such as WhatsApp and Skype remain inaccessible in many spaces. The ongoing ban on WhatsApp in many countries may in fact harm efforts to combat medical disinformation as many international organizations, including WHO, distribute COVID information via WhatsApp chatbots. To conclude, there is no single model of legal regime that suppresses activism and uh, online either globally or in the MENA region. However, authoritarian, authoritarian states are increasingly learning from and building upon each other's practices in online spaces. We are therefore witnessing a pervasive pattern of overly broad cybersecurity uh, uh, laws and weak protections for digital privacy. Combined with states' practices online and offline re regimes of authoritarianism, seek to block and undermine rights norms and rule of law in all spaces, digital and physical. Nevertheless, the cat and mouse nature of the interaction between digital and authoritarian, activism and authoritarian uh, 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 rule is dynamic and unstable. We've seen many cases where uh, the, the suppression of speech, use of technology has led to inno 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 innovations that further, un further account, uh, 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 go around this, uh, circumvent these uh, restrictions. So I think, there's also the possibility that the more repressive states become in using these norms, the more there will be a fight back against these norms, strengthening the application and therefore pushing back against, against the pushback on, on these freedoms. Thank you very much. Great. So I, I, I really appreciate that. I want to come back at the end for all of you to discuss this cat and mouse game and where it stands in your assessment. But the basic picture is there are new cyber specific laws being passed for repression existing laws are being applied in the cyber context for repression, whether national security laws or blasphemy, defamation type laws. And the combination is leading to a more repressive environment. Um, I, I will note there was an open question and Alexi, thank you so much for answering Charles's question. That's excellent. Um, and now we will move on to Mona and Masa together. 
Okay, hi everyone, let me share my screen. Um, let's hope this would work. All right, um, you can see my full screen, right? Okay, perfect. All right, okay, hi everyone, thanks for having us today. Um, I will briefly talk about um, content moderation and the hurdles of content moderation in the Arab world specifically and MENA region broader. Uh, and I will leave the floor for Massa to talk specifically about the Palestinian case that we all have been um, seeing recently. Um, as Ahmed said, like it's absolutely like laws and regulations have been used um, since forever to suppress the, um, to suppress social media in the Arab world and MENA region more broadly. In addition to that, the architectural design of social media platforms have also been suppressing voices since forever and since 2011, as we have back then celebrated uh, platform uh, for bringing democracy to the region. However, at the same time, their suppression was starting from there. However, this topic of, uh, platform suppression is not as common as, you know, government suppression and other forms of suppression. And I believe there are two reasons why uh, platform suppression is a very complicated topic to discuss in, in the context of the region. First of all, because and 10 years ago, we celebrated and we hailed these platforms for bringing democracy to the region. We called them Facebook revolutions. We called them Twitter revolutions. Uh, even Mark Zuckerberg himself took the credit for the 2011 Arab Spring uh, for because of all of the features of his technology. He believed that it facilitated uh, the uprisings back then. It took us a while as academics, writers, policymakers, and a lot of people to say it out loud that these platforms are harming the region, are not supporting the region. Um, the narrative took a, a long while to change, and, and until we change it the way uh, we talk about platforms, um, I mean, the damage has already been done. The second reason why we actually don't talk about this much is that it's a complicated topic. It's very difficult to prove and to study and analyze. I don't want to take us to methods and methods of analyzing content, content moderation, but it's indeed difficult. Um, you can, I mean, the, what even like when you look at the Palestinian case, most of the resources that we have is based on crowdsourced reports uh, by users. Again, the algorithmic, um, the algorithms is a big black box that uh, it's very difficult to crack. Saying this, I will briefly uh, summarize uh, the, bias, the different types of biases uh, by platforms that are directed to the Arab world. Um, as you can see here, there are five different types. There are more, but these are the most common and most discussed uh, types of platform bias in the Arab world. Uh, the first one is a content removal. Um, again, like it's been a subject since 2011, has been people have been talking about it more and more and more. And of course, you can see the amount of gun removal in Palestine, which Massa will talk about uh, in a second. The most known example of a content removal is uh, the YouTube AI takedown of the Syria videos on, on YouTube, which was drastic for so many reasons, not just because it erased important history and important records, but also because it eliminated uh, war records that could be uh, taken to court to actually show the violation of human rights by the Syrian regime. Uh, I'm not talking about a one video or two, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of videos that were removed uh, because they were mistakenly uh, uh, thought as a, uh, graphic content by uh, the, um, the algorithms. Uh, another uh, major bias is the restriction and deletion, deletion of the accounts, uh, of activist accounts in different countries, different examples. Uh, activists have been um, complaining about this since 2011 again. And of course, like the boom was in 2021 with Palestine. Of course, we're going to talk about this. Lack of measures, like again, look at the US 2020 elections and look at the comparison between it took platforms a year and a half to prepare for the US 2020 elections. However, you, we saw the Tunisian 2019 election and there was absolute silence from platforms, not even a press release. Um, also reach reduction, which is a new, not a new thing, but uh, there are more complaints about this recently, especially with a Palestinian case that users are complaining that their uh, views have been reduced uh, by social media platforms, specifically on Instagram. 
limiting data access compared to the global north where researchers are given data over data and sometimes even grants to study uh, platforms. This is less common in the global south, specifically in our region. And limiting data access, I will give you a good example of this. You can try it even after you finish the famous Facebook ad library, which is, um, is a very, very good source to archive political ads. Uh, it's something that very priceless actually for uh, Western researchers who study the US, who study Europe, uh, who can see you know, which ads are being released on Facebook. However, this kind of resource is not available when you study political ads in the Arab world because Facebook says that they don't have the capacity to do that. Um, this kind of limitation is absolutely harmful, especially during election time and during political crises. I'll leave the floor to my colleague, Massa, who will discuss uh, specifically the policy in case. Thank you. Hi, hello there. Um, I am just trying to see. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yes, um, I mean, one of the concepts Mona and I try to delve into is this concept of a digital apartheid that we're seeing. So we see presented view, not preview. Sorry? We see presented view. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 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 Let me go back. Um, okay. I think that's good. So one of the concepts that we try to um, delve in to for our paper is the concept of digital apartheid. So typically when we're looking at the MENA region and all the past work done on internet access in Palestine, the concept of a digital divide has been spoken about and it's a larger problem, um, I guess with countries, uh, I don't wanna say global south, but with periphery countries um, when dealing with content moderation. But recently the term digital apartheid has come to be used. I mean, this past May, we've seen it used in publications by Nadine Nashif um, uh, in a piece he wrote about the events that have been going on. Al Jazeera has written about it. And it's really, um, I guess, coming into standard language with um, the recognition of human rights organizations like Beth Salem and Human Rights Watch uh, recognizing uh, apartheid um, in Israel and Palestine. Um, but we, we try to argue that this concept of digital apartheid, I think we can expand it to look at the unequal policies within the region in general and um, the overall discrimination users uh, face. And in particular, we focus on uh, Facebook. Um, we question whether this new digital apartheid could be a new form of Orientalism, hearkening back to Edward Said's um, third book in his Orientalism series covering Islam, where um, you know, he co considers contemporary forms of Orientalism in the media. And when considering the, the applications of Facebook's community standards and a lot of the removals we're seeing, um, it, it's really provoke, uh, provocative to, I guess, consider this as this new form of Orientalism. Two kinds um, of the community standards that we often see, and we see it regionally, we've seen it in Iran, Lebanon, um, and we've been seeing it a lot um, in Palestine, which is um, dangerous individuals and organizations, which of course uh, uses the US sanctions and US FTO list to apply. Um, and this in itself is quite problematic as you know, um, I think the Middle East region in general has a lot of individuals and organizations that are on the US sanction list, but are not on the UN sanctions list, for example. Um, and these are the overbroad applications we often see. And there's a lot of these organizations, I mean, um, as far as you know, the the application of this for Iran's revolutionary guards, for example, it means a lot of benign content is removed, um, even if users are just discussing news related to these organizations that are such a big part of national security and social and political discourses. So it puts a lot of limits on freedom of expression. Um, 
I know since Christchurch, there is a group that has been created that Facebook is part of. It's the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, which I think actually uh, Stanford's Global Digital Policy Incubator is part of. And they look at, I guess, regulating terrorist content according to the UN sanctions list. And despite um, all of this work, um, for the, these new regulations for terrorist content, um, Facebook still relies on the US sanctions list. Um, another thing we've been seeing a lot of is bullying or harassment. And this is just very simply, we're seeing it for um, uh, uh, representations of Palestinian identity. Uh, one of the most famous cases we saw last year was Bella Hadid had posted uh, a photo of her father's uh, passport, which said his place of birth was Palestine, and it was removed for bullying and harassment. Now, there's hundreds of cases like these that occur um, for Palestinians. However, obviously, Bella Hadid is a celebrity, so this made headline news, but there's um, hundreds of cases that do not have those kinds of headline news. The thing about Facebook also is, um, you know, there's a lot of um, officials, lots of documentation of Israeli officials saying that they have a very positive response rate from Facebook um, in terms of their requests. And uh, I personally have been in a lot of uh, conversations with Facebook, and I'm sure a lot of other people on this panel have been in conversations with Facebook where their response to this is, well, you know, the Israeli officials are boasting. Um, we don't actually uh, remove 95% of the content they ask us to remove. However, the important thing, which Mona also discussed, is the documentation, which is sometimes quite hard, but recently it's gotten much better. So in 2016, when Ailet Shaket said that 95% of the content um, that they requested was removed after meeting with Facebook personally, there was a trove of Palestinian accounts that Al Jazeera, for example, documented that were removed. Right now, you know, Hamle has uh, documented about 500 removals. Um, Myself and Mona are part of another coalition documenting other um, uh, forms of removal. And it's very important to, I guess, have these receipts when you go to Facebook because Facebook has continually said that um, what was experienced after Sheikh Jarrah what was just a technical glitch. But even after they said they fixed the technical glitch, the documentation and the cases that users are reporting uh, seems to indicate otherwise. Um, Hamla had a really great report from some of the documentation they did the other week. Um, uh, the central platform was Instagram where a lot of this was happening and Mona described some of the instances before. Now, um, I mean, content moderation issues and policies preceded um, the outbreak of you know, events uh, following Sheikh Jarrah. Um, but for the first time, we're, it seems that we're seeing ripple effects in Facebook's market in the Middle East. Now, the Middle East isn't um, a significant market for Facebook, but it is a developing kind of futures market for them that they do care about. So um, we pulled up the Google App Store in Egypt. Egypt has one of the highest penetration rates in the Arab world. Um, and we were trying to see what was happening with the rankings of different platforms over the past month. Um, so here uh, you can see at the bottom, the yellow is Twitter. And so Twitter, um, being one of the less controversial platforms, although it had some issues, it, it saw a, a slight rise um, in its rankings post Sheikh Jarrah. And then um, some of the Facebook platforms, if you see, um, you see a dip here. These are the Facebook platforms that we see have ha seen um, slight uh, lower rankings after the um, events and I guess the publicity around the issues with the content removal. Um, so this could possibly uh, signal positive signs. Um, we've seen uh, in reports that Facebook through leaks, um, uh, people are showing uh, evidence that there is a significant bias, a pro-Israeli bias within the company. They've um, increased the severity level of the issue within the region to severity level one, according to leaks uh, given to NBC News. And um, I just like to end the, the presentation with Mark Zuckerberg's quote that we sh showed earlier on, which is um, Mark Zuckerberg discussing um, 
authoritarian information control and how Facebook was liberating um, users from this. And it's quite ironic because it seems that um, a lot of users now need to find liberation from some of these problematic policies that Facebook has, where he said these voices will increase in number and volume, they cannot be ignored. And it seems, um, you know, with the publicity of these events that that might be, this could be a positive sign for some change. Great. Well, you both did a great job of demonstrating this dramatic swing of the pendulum from this moment a decade ago where we felt like these were liberation technologies. Larry Diamond has written a lot about this and that the platforms, social media was primarily for revolution, democratic revolution. And now we are at the, your assessment that they are more harmful than good. When we come back to questions, I would love to dig further into um, what's what will be needed for researchers to really tease apart and delineate three things you've really pointed to. One is lack of actual um, cultural expertise, let's say language expertise and capacity in the region on the platform side. Then there's also bias within the platform and their own interpretive lens. And then there's actually the pressure from government to, you know, and, and that relationship and the power of government to influence the platforms. And what do we need to tease that apart further? So now we are going to turn to Mohammed. Hello, hi. Uh, <clears throat> so the title of the paper is Follow the Money for Better Digital Rights. Uh, this is, I mean, we, we picked the title. This is still a working title for the paper we submitted. And this is something that we started investigating and we hope we will dig more in the topic in the future. Uh, our focus was mainly on Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia and UAE. And this paper has been done by my colleague Afaf Abrugi and myself. So basically, we divided the paper into three different sections. The, the first main point is like, what makes the GCC countries a conducive environment to the tech industry? And the second point is how the region's governments, and particularly Saudi Arabia and UAE, are exploiting technology to oppress populations and crack down on human rights. And the third one, we want to dig more into human rights implication of tech companies operating in the region within the GCC repressive uh, environment. And we, we're, we're ending up with like some, some recommendations to these companies and other key, key actors. Um, okay, so basically the, the first question that comes to our, to our mind really like what, what are the components that makes the GCC a, con, a conducive environment to tech industry? I mean, basically, uh, the Gulf states have been heavily investing in technology uh, as a way to be less dependent on oil. Like there's a few examples that we're sharing. Uh, Dubai, for example, is a home for the MENA regional offices of tech giants like Facebook, Google, and Twitter. There has been a lot of support from the government ICT fund to research and train in the field. Uh, UAE cabinet now includes a minister of advanced technology, a minister of, of AI, et cetera. Uh, other Gulf countries are now trying to catch up, specifically Saudi Arabia, with the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman access to power. Uh, Saudi Arabia embarked on a series of reforms and programs to restructure and diversify its all dependent economy as part of its 2030 vision. So the kingdom have increased their fiber optic uh, capacity. They have introduced new technical programs on AI and cybersecurity, and they started a program to transform Saudi oil giant, giant Aramco into a leader in other sectors, including cloud services. Uh, also investments from the region's sovereign wealth, wealth, wealth funds. So there's the Saudi wealth fund. Uh, it's really one of the biggest, largest funds in the world. Uh, and they are particularly attractive to technology companies and startups in the region and beyond. Um, for example, in 2020, both Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund and Abu Dhabi Mubadala Investment Company acquired stakes in Indian technology company Geo Platforms, investing 1.5 billion and 1.2 billion. So that's like a huge number in terms of investment. Uh, PIF is also a shareholder in Uber. So after they invested 3.5 billion. And the American technology company that provides transportation. 
And uh, this investment have earned PIF a seat in Uber's board of directors. On the other hand, Mubadala has an ICT investment portfolio. So they included a lot of social media apps, services. They recently announced a direct investment of $75 million in the encrypted messaging app Telegram, uh, which also had quarters in Dubai and London. Uh, there's also other factors that make the GCC a conducive environment. For example, um, they are one of the highest internet penetration rates in the world. Uh, their infrastructure, including fiber optic and 5G networks, there is a lot of increase in digitalization. And there's also a lot of promotion that the, the region is safe and secure. Um, also, there's an addition to that, which is the, the region multiple free economic zones, uh, which is a big incentives. And also they have done a lot of deduction of tax or low taxation for foreign and local businesses and investors. Uh, for example, as part of its 2040 vision, Oman will exempt companies and sectors aimed at economic diversification from income taxes if they start operating in the country between January 2021 and December 2022. Um, so how the GCC have used the technology as a lever of power? So beyond serving as an opportunity for economic growth and diversification for GCC governments, technology is used as a lever of power to control dissent and populations. At home control over the digital space is maintained through the use of spyware, internet filtering technologies, and trolls deployed to harass activists and dissidents and manipulate online discourse. Uh, for example, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, and Oman have all previously purchased surveillance system from UK, defense companies, Bay Systems. In 2020, Israeli media reported that Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and UAE signed contracts with the infamous Israeli NSO group to acquire surveillance spyware. And the usage of these spyware has previously been documented in these four countries and Qatar, including for the purpose of spying on dissident journalists and human rights defenders. UAE has successfully and uniquely emerged as a leader in leveraging its resources to deploy and promote local projects and technologies to help ensure the control over its citizens. Uh, for example, one of the biggest projects that exists, and I'm not sure if it's known matter, is uh, actually a spy firm called Dark Matter, which presents itself as a cybersecurity company. Dark Matter is most notorious for its involvement in Project Raven. I saw this was one of the questions. So basically a spying campaign that targeted the human rights defenders critiques of the Emirati government and other governments. The company is also believed to be behind a software called Totok, a free messaging and video calling app released in 2019 and registered in Abu Dhabi global market economic free zone. The app quickly gained popularity in Emirates uh, where the government has for years enforced a strict ban on most VoIP apps before security experts and technical analysis revealed that it's a spy tool. So also the UAE and Saudi Arabia in particular stepped up their usage of technology to target tribals and support their allies in the crisis through surveillance, cyber espionage, and online disinformation campaigns. So some of the disinformation campaigns that comes to mind was witnessed in Sudan in 2019 after the uprising and the revolution. It has been witnessed in Libya as well, in Egypt, and also in other countries. I mean, in Libya, to support the Field Marshal Khalid, Khalifa Haftar, he's an ally of the Saudi Emirati Alliance and Egypt, and his attempt to overthrow a UN recognized government back then. So, in terms of human rights sidelined, in this context of Saudi Emirati dominance over the GCC, and given the two countries' poor human rights records, their investment in the tech industry and specifically digital oppression tools is bad news for us and human rights defenders and democracy across the Arab region. Um, I wanna also here mention some of the other things like draconian legislation. So in the aftermath, in the aftermath of the 20, 2011 Arab uprising, as they became wary of mass protests sweeping through the region and toppling long serving regimes in Egypt, Libya and Tunisia and Yemen, so the GCC government stepped up the legislative machinery to further tighten their control over the digital space. We have documented more than dozens of all these laws that actually affected uh, speech in the region, uh, sorry, in, in the Gulf, but now it's affecting the region all because all the countries are learning from each other as well. 
When it comes to business and human rights, there's a lot to say here uh, because there's an increased adoption of technology in the MENA region. Um, so international tech companies have found the opportunity to expand and enter a new market. Um, from a business perspective, this is a lucrative opportunity for them. Uh, uh, for the monarchies in the Gulf, this is also an opportunity to control the online space and to build an, and to build and improve their digital authoritarian empire. It was a win-win situation. Like that's that's our assumption. Like that's that's what that, that's what we have seen so far. So tech companies are taking advantage of these regimes, and these regimes are taking advantage of these companies. Uh, so the focus on making profit only exposed how naive really tech companies approach was and their lack of knowledge about the region's socio-political structure. It was a matter of time before seeing many of these tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, and others parachuting into UAE, the most economically and technologically developed country in the Gulf. Uh, so I wanna share here as well a few examples briefly just to show some of the anecdotes that we, we have. So when it comes to freedom of expression, uh, one of the interesting cases that we, we want to share and that was brought to our attention is in 2011 is related to Apple at iTunes Mina. So basically, one of the Lebanese band named Al-Rahal Kabir, they were forbidden from uploading their album to iTunes Mina. And after, we and after our investigation, we discovered that there is actually a third party company hired by Apple called Kanawati and based in UAE. And this company, third party company, took the decision not to upload these songs since they identified them as sensitive to the region. I mean, the band was mocking ISIS leader, Baghdadi and political oppression in the region. So we did some campaigning against Apple and iTunes and they managed to go through a Turkish third party company. But some of the, some of the songs are remained accessible but not all of them are accessible to the Gulf market. So that's an interesting example to, to identify how much we don't know as well about our region. Uh, there's another famous example that comes from Netflix censorship. Uh, so there's an episode for the comedian Hassan Minaj, Patriot Acts, because of the request of the Communication and Information Technology Commission, CITC, in Saudi Arabia, they accuse him of breaching the cybercrime law in the kingdom. So the episode was mocking Mohammed bin Salman and BS, the kingdom reaction to the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi and the Saudi-led war in Yemen. So when it comes to privacy and data protection, there's also so much scrutiny in the companies uh, and businesses operating in the region. So Google just announced recently a partnership with Aramco Aramco is a Saudi government owned oil giant to start data centers inside Saudi Arabia, which opens the door on collecting data from the whole region. I mean, not only Saudi Arabia, this is like covers the whole region. So unfortunately, this is not the only project happening in the Gulf because also both Microsoft and Amazon are on the same track. Uh, they are already operating in Bahrain and other countries. Surveillance has been a lucrative business as well. Uh, for international tax spy firm and cybersecurity companies. The UAE has been using Israeli NSO. You all know the story of Ahmad Mansour in 2016, that he was targeted and uh, UAE paid $1 million to NSO to target his phone. And back then Apple needed to do an update for the software to actually uh, protect their applications. Uh, but the scandal didn't stop UAE nor the NSO for doing more business, unfortunately, in the region and target activists. Uh, it is believed that NSO and its spyware played a role in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi somehow, the Washington Post columnist. Months prior to his assassination on October 2018, a successful surveillance operation targeted Omar Abdelaziz, another Saudi dissident living in Canada. So the surveillance against Abdelaziz exposed his WhatsApp conversation with Khashoggi and their potential plan for social media activism against the kingdom. Uh, Omar himself believes that the campaign played a key role in Khashoggi's killing inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. So tech companies are in bed with authoritarian regimes and dictatorship in GCC and in our region, which represent a threat to human rights across the entire Arab region. Uh, so some of the conclusion and recommendations we have 
first, we really need international tech companies. We really, they should conduct robust and credible human rights due diligence before doing any business and launching any operations in the region. In addition to companies operating already in the Gulf, they should reassess their presence in the region. Given the deteriorating human rights situation, not only in the Gulf, but across all our region. Human rights impact assessment should also be extended to any investments coming from local and national investors, as these are often tied to government with poor human rights record. Western democracies should consider imposing a strict ban on the sale of surveillance and filtering technologies to Gulf governments and impose sanctions on companies that violate this ban due to their poor human rights record. Civil society groups like ourselves working on the intersection of technology and human rights in the region, we really need to increase our engagement with tech startups, entrepreneurs operating in and or from the Gulf. This engagement should include discussions about issues of utmost concerns, including respect for data privacy, privacy and freedom of speech, due diligence and transparency report. Thank you so much. Wow, very thought provoking. So um, when we come back to the Q&A, I just wanna ask you to reflect a little bit. The, the point about uh, export controls and banning um, spyware or the export of spyware and technology for surveillance and censorship, that's one category. I am curious if there is, and, and also the second piece of the idea that, uh, international tech companies, especially those based in democracies, should be doing human rights impact assessments, due diligence processes, definitely. Is there a way to delineate other types of technologies, infrastructure, um, not spyware, which is clearly going to be used for um, de detrimental purposes? Is there a way to delineate different types of tech systems and embed democratic values into those systems and continue to play a role in the region rather than have it be a binary choice where you either are in there or you're out of there and they, they turn to other sources for development of this repressive tech. So just, just a thought, I'm curious about that. Uh, I think now we're gonna turn to James who's also gonna dive more deeply into the tech infrastructure systems. Hi, Ellie, thank you very much. I'm just going to share my slide. Hopefully, you can see that now. Um, thanks very much to all the organizers uh, for putting together this panel and the series of panels. I found them really fantastic so far. And thanks also to the previous panelists who have set up this presentation really nicely. Um, it means I don't have to explain too much about the background into it and just dive straight into the detail. In the interest of time, I'm going to give quite a high level overview, just some general findings. Hopefully, you can talk more about them in the QA afterwards, or feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to discuss these things further. So, I'll be talking about the implementation of digital surveillance infrastructure in the Gulf. Hopefully, everyone here is pretty aware of what digital surveillance is, and after the presentation, is very aware about why um, the Gulf states, GCC states, and especially the European and Saudi Arabia are a really important site in which to study this. So I'm going to focus on the two other words in the title, implementation and infrastructures. Uh, why are we talking about surveillance? James, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you could get closer to your mic, I think it would be helpful for all of us. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Perfect. Hopefully that, hopefully that works better. Um, so I'm going to focus on the implementation uh, of digital surveillance infrastructures and also on uh, what it means for them to be infrastructures themselves. Uh, I'm going to run this presentation just by uh, going through a common refrain that we see both in academic uh, and uh, media work on the region, uh, which is that Western companies sell surveillance technologies to authoritarian regimes. Right, That's a, a key claim in um, a lot of the literature here, um, but it also underpins uh, movements around digital authoritarianism more broadly, this kind of technology that underpins digital authoritarianism, and also the focus of this panel on authoritarian adaptation. And there's lots of different kinds of adaptation. We've heard some of the legal ones earlier. We've heard some of the ones around engaging with content moderation. This is another kind of adaptation. So this is a key claim in the literature, and I want to pick apart a few different uh, parts of this claim in turn to see you know, 
why they're maybe a bit more complex than can be summarized here, even though you know, I've written sentences like it myself, and why that really matters. So let's start with the idea of uh, surveillance technologies. As Mohammed and some of the other panelists have emphasized, there are different kinds of technologies being uh, sold to the region. Um, some of these, like the NSO group examples, are very targeted. Right? They're designed to um, evade uh, security uh, mechanisms in terms of individual devices and gain illegitimate access to those devices. They enable uh, the users to go around things um, like end-to-end -end encryption by getting persistent access to pretty much everything on a device, to owning that device. Um, I'm not going to be talking about that very much today because that's um, in the literature a lot and it's out there in the media a lot. I want to talk more about infrastructural kinds of surveillance, and they're importantly different. Uh, we can think about infrastructural kinds of surveillance as baked in to broader technological um, advancements, uh, especially in terms of the adoption of digital communications technologies. They're designed not to be noticed. So if you're building, for example, smart cities or new communications networks, you will build these kinds of surveillance technologies into those infrastructures rather than trying to adopt them as being particularly targeted. And also, they're very dual use, or even better, multi-use. Right? So as infrastructures, they can be used for surveillance, but they can also be used for legitimate purposes, traffic management, um, you know, some kinds of content filtering, things like that. Um, so infrastructural and target surveillance technologies, it's clearly a spectrum. There's lots of middle ground there, but it's an important distinction to make in this broader claim. Let's now talk about Western companies. And we had a couple of questions about uh, what's going on here, especially related to the Project Raven reporting. To start with, it's not just Western companies. Obviously, Western is a problematic term in itself, but there's many suppliers outside the US and Europe. Uh, Israel is a major one, but also ones from India and China and South Asia. Even those that are in the US and Europe have constantly changing and complex corporate structures. Right? They change their headquarters to get around often export regulation, but also for financial reasons as, as well. Right? There's a lot of money laundering and uh, financial regulation in the US and Europe. These, these companies often want to avoid. Right? So they have constantly changing corporate structures. Just saying these are Western companies is not always that easy. Let's dig in a little bit further. And then you see actually that companies work often through resellers in the region. Right? These are companies based in Dubai or elsewhere um, that are channeling a lot of different uh, surveillance companies that make these technologies towards their end customers. Right? They're a key middle point in these transactions. And also, as the original questioner noticed, uh, states in the region are investing in local alternatives, ones that don't require uh, leapfrogging export regulation or engaging in these kinds of international transactions, not only for uh, these kinds of audit reasons, but also because it enables them to use their own talent, right? To, uh, build a industry in these kinds of uh, forms of expertise in the region. Now let's move to, well, who's the object of the sale? Is it the authoritarian regime itself? Again, this is a little bit more complicated. Right? Many companies uh, in this uh, field work with multiple govern government clients and not always with the knowledge of each of these clients. Right? So when you look at leaked documents from these companies, uh, if you talk to uh, the salespeople, then they'll be trying to get contracts for entirely commercial reasons with as many people as possible across government. And this means that surveillance sales are caught up in bureaucratic politics as different government branches from national security agencies, military, ministries of interior and defense and that kind of thing are all sort of jockeying for position and using surveillance technologies as part of their bureaucratic politics. This is something that isn't usually recognized. To go a little bit further, we can say we should focus more on the telecom sector. Right? Telecoms regulators and companies are a natural place for these infrastructural surveillance technologies, maybe rather than the targeted ones, uh, to, to land um, because they're in charge of not only uh, telecoms networks, but also internet networks, data centers, uh, international cable points, access points, and things like that. Right? So having telecoms regulators and telecom companies as a focal point with these kinds of surveillance technologies really takes us away from the more national security parts of the state. And they themselves have a mix of commercial and security rationales for adoption. So we sort of uh, questioned a few of the different aspects of this major claim in the literature. The what I want to focus on though is the smallest word, which is SEP. 
right? This seems to be the easiest one. It's the one that doesn't require the most questioning, but actually it's the most interesting. Um, do they sell surveillance technologies? The short answer is no. Often what they do is they license certain technologies with pretty strict service and maintenance agreements. So you might uh, provide a license, you might provide uh, certain boxes that people can plug in, but they still require training on these devices and troubleshooting. These are often long-term relationships between the companies, remember their resellers as well, and their customers. Um, so it's not just a sale, it's not just a transfer, some kind of equipment, this is a corporate relationship. And this is why the focus of this panel on norms and practices is really important. These aren't just technologies, but these are norms and practices baked into the infrastructure itself. Let's go a little bit further into selling. Um, well, if you do have lots of international um, companies working in this market, then you have foreign consultants raising a few little problems. Um, as a Project Raven reporting suggests, sometimes they raise ethical issues, or they maybe don't want to uh, be seen to target uh, the First Lady of the US, as is commonly reported, but also they have connections back to countries that maybe uh, the customer state doesn't necessarily want to be uh, particularly strengthened. Right? This might be the case with Israel, but it might also be the case with many other states as well. Right? So there are quiet connections created through these training and uh, commercial relationships. Most interestingly, what you see is that when there are consultants, engineers on site, they are building, they are maintaining these infrastructural surveillance infrastructure so surveillance technologies, they're able to redesign and also constrain them as they go. And so we usually have an image of these technologies as very powerful, quite rightly so, as able to monitor large swathes of um, data and pick out individual communications. Um, but actually there's a lot of scope for those implementing these technologies to alter them as they see fit. And in my research, what I see is sometimes they do so because they're concerned about the use of these technologies. I call this a moral maneuver, where they actually try and alter the implementation of such technologies to avoid maybe some of the more extreme kinds of violations that occur in this space. That's um, obviously not always the case, as the public report suggests. There are clearly many violations associated with these technologies that are out there, and I don't mean to diminish them at all. Um, but this sort of quick overview suggests that when we see claims like the ones about Western companies selling surveillance technology to authoritarian regimes. There's a lot of different ways which we can unpack that claim, get into more detail, and they really matter for the effectiveness of these technologies and therefore the underpinning of digital authoritarianism and authoritarian adaption more broadly. Um, for more detail and for more um, sort of basis on specific cases and countries, um, I do have uh, a book coming out on this very shortly. Thank you very much. Um, back to Eddie. Really fascinating and also thought provoking. So I hear a lot of skepticism about the, um, the impact of export control measures, given these larger dynamics, potential of local industries, complex supply chain, etc. Um, I also and, and your emphasis on the it's not all about controlling the sale of the technology, it's about norms and practices that we need to export to the region and spread around the world. I am wholeheartedly in agreement there. In the q and I really hope you come to back to a different question, which we haven't even touched on yet, remarkably, is um, geopolitical tensions between the United States and China over the export of telco information infrastructure and whether and how that is playing out in the MENA region at all. Um, so I, for last presentation, though, is we will turn to Lexi to talk about digital insecurity within the civil society community in the region. Uh, thanks, Eileen. Um, can, can everyone, can, can you see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, so actually, uh, and thanks also to James. His, his presentation could not have more perfectly um, uh, offered a segue to, to mine. So this is, this is a presentation about uh, primarily about data and empirics, but I just wanted to offer a kind of 30,000 foot uh, theoretical overview, which is probably in the back of the panelists' minds, but uh, we didn't cover it today yet. So, you know, I think citizens, not, not only in the Middle East and North Africa, but everywhere, they are trying to, they want to protect themselves in the first place from 
the violence of anarchy. Uh, and so that's why they that's why they have a government, right? That's why they have this leviathan that monopolizes violence and mitigates uh, this uh, the threat of the uh, the war of all against all, where your life is nasty, brutish, and short, as Hobbes put it. And the problem with the monopolist on violence is that it kind of solves one problem but creates another. It solves the problem of being attacked by criminals and bandits and predators, but then the government itself, as a monopolist of violence, could be incredibly unaccountable and, and tyrannical, right? So that creates this threat of tyranny. So to protect against that, citizens need a, a robust civil society. What does civil society mean? Well, everyone has a different answer to that, but think of social movements, uh, independent news media, labor unions, uh, professional syndicates, all of, all of these different actors that, um, uh, that, that, that constitute a kind of a meso layer between citizens and the government that solve citizens' collective action problems and inform them about government uh, misdeeds and misbehavior and help citizens challenge the authorities. Now, the government is not gonna take that lying down. Right? They, they don't like being challenged by citizens. So they try, and you can see evidence of this all across the Middle East and North Africa, they try to co-opt and repress uh, uh, civil society. And it's not only in Middle East, uh, in North Africa, um, but you know we're, we're particularly familiar with it in that context. And so surveillance is part of both the co-option and the repression strategies. The idea is the government can see what civil society is up to and can anticipate how it's going to challenge authority and then can preventively act either to arrest particular people or to co-opt them into, into the regime. And so we, you, you can, of course, civil society is becoming, uh, is, is, is going digital. And so surveillance is also going digital, right? And so you can see from threat reports by Citizen Lab, Amnesty International, and so on over recent years that there's been uh, this rise in digital surveillance. And so then this raises the question, what is civil society doing to protect itself from cybersecurity threats uh, uh, from, from state level actors. And this question may seem, may seem like a natural question, but it also relates to what James and also uh, Muhammad were saying. There's, uh, there's a different question you could ask, which is how can we prevail upon Western policymakers to adjust export laws to reduce uh, 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 the access of these Middle East North African regimes um, to surveillance technologies? This question I'm asking instead is, what is civil society in the region doing on its own proactively to uh, protect itself from cybersecurity? So the question actually begins maybe out of a place of despair that probably these regimes one way or other are going to get access to uh, state-of-the-art surveillance technologies. Um, and so it's gonna be up to civil society to protect itself. There isn't going to be um, uh, a mitigating factor from abroad. And scholars, and the other point is that scholars can, can help out with this, but so far data collection is pretty scarce and piecemeal. One thing that's going on uh, in a great paper by uh, a colleague, Leonard Mashmeyer and, and others at Citizen Lab, um, basically that they, they argue that cybersecurity professionals have a, uh, a, prof a profitable preoccupation with, with worrying about the security of government or the security of corporations. There's not a lot of money to be made thinking about the security of civil society. Outside of a few very high profile civil society organizations, most uh, cannot afford anyway to, to be hiring uh, in-house security or even really um, getting uh, penetration testing. Um, the other point is that cybersecurity, and this is really driven home nicely in, uh, in, in James's forthcoming book, which I encourage you all to read, um, is that cybersecurity itself is imagined more state-centric. It's how do we protect the state and our citizens from decentralized actors? How do you protect your bank account from, from some criminal hacker? Or how do you protect the state from terrorism or from other states? But not how do you protect citizens from the state itself? That's not usually the way the threat model is articulated. Uh, but that itself is, is changing. So organizations like Citizen Lab, Amnesty International are uh, challenging that concept through what, what James calls a moral maneuver, which I think is a cool, um, I hope I'm not misusing that term, but I think it's cool. Um, 
Uh, now, when you look, however, at Citizen Lab and Amnesty, they tend to write threat reports. So these are really impressive technical deep dives into specific uh, 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 attack infrastructure, specific malware binaries. Um, they, they're kind of points of light in a larger data void. They don't give you a lot of perspective, but they give you these really cool in-depth investigations. The one literature where you tend to see security assessments is actually the digital journalism literature, but there tends to be a Western focus. There tends to be a focus on individuals instead of organizations themselves. Uh, a lot of reliance on self-reporting. So a typical paper in this literature, uh, the, the, the scholar will simply ask somewhere between 10 to maybe at the outside 50 uh, journalists to just ask them about their security habits uh, instead of kind of objectively assessing them. And uh, because they're not focused on organizations, they're also not looking at web security. So that's going to be the particular attack surface that I'm uh, trying to draw attention to. So organizations, uh, and especially news media, uh, will tend to have websites. They have a, a web-facing aspect to their organization, and that itself can be um, the target of attack. The nice thing is that web websites advertise themselves. They're meant to be found. Um, at least in the case of these organizations. And so uh, you can scan them uh, remotely. Even during COVID, you don't have to go out. You can sit at home, as I've done, and, uh, and scan these, these sites. And so along with the co-author, who prefers to remain um, unidentified, that, that's not anonymous collective, by the way. That's just a, a, a co-author who doesn't want to be identified today. Um, we scanned, uh, we, 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 we scripted a web scanning tool to scan websites around the world and anywhere around the world and just check if the websites and the underlying web servers are uh, following through on a basic set of security precautions. Have they enabled encrypted uh, sessions through HTTPS? Um, are they using the most up-to-date version of WordPress or Drupal or Joomla? You know, it's common kind of content management systems that websites are built on. Uh, the underlying web server is its software up to date. Uh, are HTTP security set, uh, uh, headers set, and uh, are they availing? Uh, is the organization availing itself of protection from distributed denial of service attacks? So the nice thing about this is you can just scan thousands, actually tens of thousands, of of websites and create uh, an overview of civil society's cyber cybersecurity preparedness, at least on this particular attack service of the web, uh, with the caveat being, of course, that it's not a full security assessment. It's just a, a sort of a reduced set of um, dimensions that we're measuring this on. So as a proof of concept, we had a look at Palestinian uh, civil society organizations. Um, as you may have all noticed in the past few weeks, Palestinian civil society is resurging again after, I think, the uh, collapse of the Oslo peace process. And it is once again, the kind of the central reference of the Palestinian struggle. So we thought we'd start there and scan a few hundred Palestinian CSOs and see if they're, if they're following basic security precautions with, with their websites and web servers. And they're not doing very well, right? So roughly a third of them don't even, have not even enabled uh, uh, HTTPS. Um, just over 40% of them require it, and hardly any of them actually require the web browser to, to remember that. Just one out of 228 organizations we scanned has availed itself of DDoS protection. Um, only a third of them have up-to-date uh, uh, website software, and almost a quarter of the web servers from which Palestinian CSOs are serving their websites uh, exhibit a publicly known vulnerability that exceeds a CVS score of seven. So it's considered high or critical, both in the sense that um, someone to exploit that vulnerability would uh, be able to have considerable access, and also in the sense that creating such an exploit would not be too hard to do. So this created a question, why are Palestinian CSOs so uh, insecure? So one thing is it can't be purely a technical explanation. Right? So social scientists, sometimes their eyes glaze over and they say, well, this is all you know, computer security stuff. It's out of our wheelhouse. But here, solutions already exist. Right? The HTTPS protocol has existed for 20 years. DDoS protection uh, is, is uh, something publicly known. 
Um, the, you, can, you can update your software. Um, it's also not clearly something that falls under a financial constraint. Um, so you can convert to you can convert to HTTPS for, for cheap or for free. You can update your software typically for free or, or at minimal expense. DDoS protection is freely available to civil society organizations through Cloudflare and other organizations. Is it a Palestinian specific thing? Uh, we scanned a bunch of Israeli think tanks and news agencies to compare. Um, it seems that partly explains it. The Israeli CSOs are a little uh, better off, but they're still pretty bad in absolute terms. I mean, a quarter of Israeli news, uh, news agencies or think tanks do not offer HTTPS. Um, half of them don't have up-to-date CMS. Uh, so so it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a Palestine-specific thing, something to do with being under military occupation or so on. And then we thought maybe it's a kind of a security by obscurity uh, story. So these CSOs just don't anticipate being the target of state level attack. So, uh, you know, maybe they're not involved in contentious politics. Actually, over the Oslo period, a lot of Palestinian organizations, uh, NGOs have become, uh, are thought to have become part of the kind of uh, um, uh, sort of a neoliberal technocratic uh, agenda that's, that's very depoliticized. So then we scanned a bunch of boycott, divestment, sanctions organizations, um, all of them non-Palestinian, um, because that's clearly a, pol a politically contentious activity. And so they would have every reason to, to expect to be targeted. And indeed, actually, the BDS movement website was targeted about five years ago with the DDoS attack. There too, however, as you can see in the chart, we find some pretty dismal uh, uh, security numbers. So we're really... Um, this kind of left us at a, at a loss um, as to why there's there's such insecurity, but it's, it's, it's kind of clearly a, a policy point to work on. Um, so Alexi, I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt, sure. but given how short the time is, I'm just yes. gonna, I feel like we should- Sure, I'll just wrap up right now. Perfect. Yeah, yeah sorry about that, yeah. So anyway, to, long story short, I extended the scan then to media sites all over the, uh, all over the region to see, um, if perhaps media sites, because their, their websites matter uh, a lot to their activity, perhaps they were more careful, but I still found a lot of insecurity. Saudi Arabia does really well. Um, Turkey, Turkish and Iranian news sites were um, performing the worst. And looking at uh, web server security, Tunisia was one of the worst performing, something like three in 10 Tunisian news media sites have a critical or, or uh, high vulnerability. Um, but in any case, these these data I think can be can be helpful uh, to to make sense of. Uh, you know, there's clearly cross country variation that can be analyzed here, um, and it can it can help uh, help direct efforts to to um, you know train and raise awareness um, with civil society around the region about these threats. Great. Well, thank you so much. Although that was you know you start with the despair. <laughs> as the motivation, um, not so uplifting, but that's the reality we are, that civil society is gonna have to take it upon themselves to protect themselves. But I really do love the idea that cybersecurity itself has to be reimagined as uh, the purpose of which is to protect citizens, even from states and non-state actors, rather than being state-centric. Um, I will note there was a question uh, in the chat, well, a practical question about links to your papers. I wanna say to the audience, all of these papers will be published in a journal um, at, that will be put out within a couple of months. And so you'll be able to see cleaned up versions of all of these uh, ideas in writing. Um, I now, given we have, we have about 15 minutes. And so I, I just want to sort of open up with sort of a broad opportunity for each of you to respond to what we've heard. Feel free to comment on all the different types of digital repression you've each spoken about, uh, the legal repression, the role of the social media platforms, targeted spyware, information infrastructure, um, and this general sense of digital insecurity in civil society. Talk about things you were surprised to hear. What, what do you think is most consequential? Um, what's unique to the region? What's part of the global trend? 
But here's what I really want to hear about those. I'm just throwing those out there for speak to whatever you're interested in. Um, I want to come back to optimism and pessimism um, and the interplay between digital activism and digital authoritarianism, which is our overarching theme. Um, do you have any sense of optimism that civil society can find a way to hold its own, to stay ahead? Um, is, is this just going to be a constant cat and mouse game back and forth? Or do you see a really a downward trend um, where governments are ultimately, uh, in this region at least, and perhaps more broadly in the, around the globe, moving in a digital authoritarian direction? And then the, the point James raised, what is the opportunity and the potential of norms and practices to be the vehicle for changing the role of technology? And how potent can that kind of advocacy be in terms of a normative um, diffusion of norms to go with the diffusion of technology? Um, so those are just some themes that I would love to hear about. And um, we'll just go in order and each of you take a, moment, a couple of minutes uh, to respond and anything that came up in the conversation, starting with Ahmed. Thank you very much. It's really fascinating presentations and really very thought provoking. Just to keep it very brief, I like the idea of reimagining security. You know, this was done in the past in the traditional domain as well, has, has many important effects, but we should be doing it here as well. But you know, what we're seeing is as in any technological breakthrough, the initial, the initial dimensions get caught up by others and, and there's a leveling off of, of that advantage. So I think the liberating spirit of technology has been caught up by authoritarian spirit, but there's always a, di a dialectic as it were between, you know, uh, between violations and efforts to push those and to go beyond them. Uh, if you look at the general human rights framework, it's always an interplay between there's a concern about violations and there's, and there's a catch up with protection to, to, to go beyond that. So we would see that happening here as well. And I think the, the, the attention that's been now paid to these violations, the exposure of the ways that, that, that's happening, has uh, ha, they have put a lot of pressure on people either actually perpetrating these violations or in some ways complicit in them to respond to them in ways that are less blatant. I think therein lies the, the opportunity to, to press forward. But also there's a layered approach required here. I think the geopolitical, the global uh, you know, sphere matters here. If, if, if we had, say, you know, if, if the uh, big players globally are committed to undermining rights, then we will, we have a very difficult you know, chance going forward. But if there were even a break in that kind of global situation, there is some openings through which I think the society actors, others can push through with change that the kind that, that uh, the other speakers have imagined in, in, in their presentations. I shall end there. Thank you. Aileen, you're on mute, but I think Masa and Mona are you. Thank you so much. Um, why don't we turn to Mona and then Masa? Yes, uh, I think we, like all of our presentations, really complete, completed each other. And I'm really uh, glad that we did this kind of panel where we discussed different types of digital oppression. Um, I've spent the last four years of my PhD basically focusing on what happens to uh, social movements in the Arab world if like digital oppression really increased. And the answer is not really, um, like there's no like, you know, um, one direct answer to this. Uh, if my work focused on Syria, maybe if I focus on other countries, I would have gotten different um, answers. But for my work specifically, the, the chess-like game, the idea of like, okay, when governments really increase their oppression, activists would absolutely innovate at some point. However, when um, the repression really increased, especially like you're not just dealing with government repression, you're dealing also with platform repression. You're dealing with uh, something that is increasing every day. And at some point, activists would suffer from activism fatigue. And at some point, you know, especially with the Syrian case, like activists got scattered all across the world and ended up with, it became difficult to innovate. Uh, so to sum up, um, I'm not an optimist, not a pessimist, I'm a realist. I think like there is a level of repression that movements can take and they can actually within this kind of um, 
a spectrum, they can actually do something, they can actually innovate, they can really um, find new tactics, collaborate, collaborate together, and maybe overcome repression. However, there is level that, I mean, we would be like uh, in a utopia if we said like digital media can save us during this kind of repression. Um, I think like, I'm not gonna be like, uh, an optimist here, unfortunately, uh, especially with the, I mean, after all of this presentation, I think like there, it's difficult to be optimist after all, but um, I think all, like saying this, there's always uh, some part of activists that will still try and fight and, and see the hope and the light at the end of the tunnel. So maybe there is a light at the end of the tunnel that um, maybe someday we'll be surprised with. So I will leave the floor to Massa too. I hope she's a bit optimist here. Um. I, I, I guess there is some optimism just from what I was hearing. I think Alexi was referencing James by talking about the moral maneuvering of the digital rights movement and trying to fight back. So, um, and that's something that we were trying to talk about, which is, you know, the digital rights movement has opportunities and, you know, what, what what's happening with uh, Palestine, there's a massive opportunity for digital rights to really center its message. Um, and for the movement to get strengthened and, and to help civil society. Um, but um, one thing that I did notice, which is, I mean, I spend most of my time studying and working on Iran, and Iran has a very specific geopolitical um, you know, position in the region, and it has completely different factors when you think about cybersecurity and threats um, and opportunities. And, um, and I guess if you're studying Syria or, or other countries that are positioned similarly to Iran, you, you see that. So, I mean, the strengths that you see with states um, with their digital repression in the Gulf countries, you know, you definitely don't have the Iranian state or the Syrian state definitely don't have those same opportunities and strengths. Um, so that means that there's, I guess, um, a wider margin for fighting back because their resources are, aren't um, as sophisticated necessarily to have, you know, Israeli spyware um, and things like that. But my pessimism comes from the fact of, you know, what if these authoritarian countries that happen to be on on different sides of the geopolitical divide, if those um, divides are um, overcome, which is something that a lot of people talk about peace in the Middle East, which is essentially like, you know, Iran's authoritarian government becoming friends with Saudi Arabia's authoritarian government, which then means that the authoritarian tactics are then going to spread throughout the region. And so Iran will become more um, efficient at putting down civil society and spying on its um, internet users. So then my pessimism really comes from that, um, that aspect of, you know, some of the strengths and optimisms we see might be along those geopolitical lines. Thank you so much, uh, Mohammed. Your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm kind of more leaning towards optimism as well for the for the long term, right? Uh, for the short term, it's still like we're still like in the dark. We're trying to know what we should see. Uh, and I think the question for us as well is. Uh, is like how how can we turn activism because we we're talking about activism how can we turn activism or like how can we imagine activism in a way that is an extension of critical thinkers uh who are in position and power somehow like whether in judiciary media politics and that's only the young unemployed arab in our region uh and and that's where I'm, I'm kind of optimistic because I know like there's, there's much more educated people than ever. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a good sign for me. Um, yeah, I mean, that's everything for now. Great. Uh, James. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, my reasons for pessimism come from these geopolitical sort of fractures. Um, I think, that especially in terms of surveillance infrastructures, the more you get competitors into the market, the more you get um, Chinese or other um, models being adopted, then there'll be more commercial pressure to uh, compete with that. 
and maybe a lowering of standards um, from the US and Europe. Uh, my reasons for optimism actually come from a slightly weird place um, in that there's a real tendency for all of these companies and also their customers to overpromise and underdeliver. So if they do that, then there will always be cracks. There will always be ways to resist or get around the implementation of these technologies. It's really dangerous just to assume, even though they are powerful, even though they are really um, available to these um, governments, that actually they are all seeing and all knowing. That actually it does require people with very good expertise to actually um, implement them themselves. So maybe that's a sort of perverse reason for optimism. <laughs> uh, Alexi. Yeah, thanks. So I, I think there'll be a, a, a continued cat and mouse game, um, but I just think scholars can get involved, uh, kind of like Mohammed was saying, critical thinkers can get involved to help uh, level the playing field. So I remember actually a few years ago at an APSA conference, a famous scholar of counterinsurgency and state building described his research agenda as basically saying, well, if we're going to be doing more of this, we might as well do it right. And what he meant was if we're gonna, if the West is going to be doing more counterinsurgency and state building in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere, then the West, then, then scholars might as well help the West to do that more efficiently and apply state-of-the-art science and techniques to, to figure out how to do that the most effectively. And I was really shocked by the statement at the time. Uh, and then I thought, well, actually, no, that's what if you flip it around? So what if you say, uh, we scholars who study the, you know, the wretched of the earth and their resistance of repression, what if we, if we're going to be resisting repression uh, more, then we might as well do it right. Why don't we make a science of how to do that? Um, and so I, I think I'd like to see more of that kind of um, work. And I was, I was trying to kind of uh, point towards that with, with, with the empirical work I was doing here, but we can actually get involved in this, collect data, analyze and advise civil society on how to protect itself against repressive regimes. Um, we don't have to stand on the, on the sidelines of this and we can actually help level the playing field. Well, you all did a remarkable job. I cannot believe we got all of that into this one section of the program. Um, I will say I, I am desperately trying to hold on to some sense of optimism that our norms and our technology can go together and be packaged. And I do have uh, one point of, that can be used in advocacy for, for civil society in advocacy. I, I really do see this as many of you have said as a geopolitical battle. And I think that it's not civil society alone in this battle, it is democracy itself is at stake and democratic governments really need a wake up call that it is not just repressive application of technology in other regions of the world. This is a competition over governance model or that will be used in 21st century digital society and democracy as a form of government is being challenged. And so civil society and democratic governments and private sector tech companies in the so-called West or who think of themselves as advancing free expression and democratic values need to band together and really work on packaging our norms and our technology as a better alternative than this digital authoritarian model. So let's work on that advocacy and bring those stakeholders together in this shared project. Um, I will also just remind everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, our closing program will be on Thursday. It's the final part of the series that will be moderated by Larry Diamond and really excellent speakers on cross-border information operations at the same time. And thank you all for joining us and for such a rich conversation.